All right, now I'm um, doing the school year when I teach. And of course, we're back to that again soon. This is one of the few things we do that's still online. Um, I carry this entire cart all the way around campus, and all my students' exams that I grade are the ones I carry with me. For today, I'm going to use these notes and these books. These books are the actual uh, hard copies of the book you're using. Um, except for it's an older version. So I'm going to be able to look into these books for a couple pictures that I might like, and I'll just tell you on your electronic book exactly where you could find it. It'll be like figure 16.3 or something. With that, let me roll this out of your way and we'll begin. Ugh. All right, the lecture. I presuppose that you know the organic functional groups that we went over. So I just continue from there. This chapter is called plastics or polymers. So I believe it is in your text chapter 10. This text, it probably is, but either way, it's a chapter called polymers, so I don't know if that's any different than yours. So what can I say about polymers? First of all, polymers. Long chains of monomers. Something that repeats over and over. Something that just continually repeats over and over. To remember, there was a carbon. A carbon has four bonds. Maybe I'll do this one this way. Normally. This would be methane. And the carbon atom is going to have a bond angle, as I said, if you took a marshmallow and you put four sticks, I can see where I lectured you, if you put four sticks into the marshmallow as far from each other as possible, you would get a 109 degree angle, 109.5 for molecular structure. So the next carbon atom would go here if we bonded it, but then the next one goes here and the next one goes here, they go up and down. So in this class, you're allowed to show a ring and assume that each quarter of the carbon, I'm sorry, each quarter is a carbon. In this case, it has two hydrogens on it. If I put a double bond here, it would have just one hydrogen, one hydrogen, two hydrogens, two hydrogens. But if I said draw propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, I have to show the whole structure out. If I said draw copane, I'm not going to want you to draw this, this, and assume that's a carbon, that's a carbon, that's a carbon, that with three, that with two, that with three. But when we have really long chains, this becomes a norm. So let's say I had CH3, CH2 repeated eight times CH3. It's a hydrocarbon. And it's completely nonpolar. So it's in the organic phase. It's completely nonpolar. It's in the organic phase. It will not dissolve in water. To dissolve in water, there has to be something going on with oxygen, with polarity, because water is H2O. If I had this 8, 9, 10, 10 carbons, that's the structure of decane in this case. You have to show CH3, CH2 repeated eight times CH3. You're not allowed to say C10H16, 
22, because I could make a lot of C10H22s. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 10. That's not going to be decking. But if I put sticks on here, that would be C10H22. So if somebody says decane and you look up in Wikipedia and it says the molecular formula is C10H22, as I told you in my class, you're going to have to show me the structure because we're only going to put decane. So that's not what we're covering. I can erase it, right? Just show you, you have to show structures, you have to show bond attachments. If somebody wanted to show CH3, CH2H times CH3, and you did it in a stick fashion, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A long chain of carbons goes up and down. That's a big thing in today's class. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm just trying to highlight that they go up and down. What is a polymer? Well, it's something that repeats over and over, and whatever repeats is called a monomer. So if you have, let's say, paper clips. I don't have a, a good idea about what analogies work with people anymore because people don't do the same things. But at one point before the internet, people used to just take paper clips and put them together because it was fun to make paper clip chains. So if you were to make a paper clip chain, let's say you had this paper clip chain like that, each paper clip would be the monomer. And the polymer would be called poly weird paper clip so a lot of times it's poly the, the name of the monomer the polymer would be poly paper clip with that in mind we're not going to do paper clips we're going to have something repeat first and foremost there are some natural polymers Something that I've mentioned to you in class, and I will take a book and look at pictures, was the fact that sugar glucose, of all the sugars, there's sucrose, there's dextrose, there's lactose, anything with an O is a sugar. But sugar glucose is the monomer of wood, but it's also the monomer of starch. Okay? So if I were to actually draw out a glucose first of all there's the backbone of it it looks like an ether of some sort okay it's a cyclo something with an ether inside of it we're not the name it that way and then each one of these let's put a ch2oh that's an h let's put this down oh let's put this up oh Let's put this down, OH, just H is on the other side of these. And then finally, this last one, let's put that down. This is glucose. It can be written out in a long chain, okay? It can be uh, written out as a straight chain, it's a different type of projection. What's interesting about this is, OH means sugar, but if I were to take this one OH, take it off, and put it on top, that's no longer glucose, that'd be galactose. I hope so, yes. G-A-L-A-C-T-O-S-E. So the sugars, they're all carbohydrates. The sugars are all going to be very close to each other. There could be a carbohydrate that's just this galactose by itself. That would be a monosaccharide. Mono means one. There are some sugars that are disaccharides. So for example, uh, I'll just show a little bit of this guy. Oh, I'll show the whole thing. So CH2OH, this is clearly down, this is clearly up, this is clearly down, and then this over here goes down and bonds to the next little fella, 
And this is going to be a five membered ring. And this five membered ring is going to have something slightly different on it. It's going to have up here CH2OH, and it's going to have down here CH2OH with an H here. And this side is going to be an OH, and that's an H. And then this side is going to be an OH, and that's an H. This would be a disaccharide. And your body would have to be able to break the bond of the disaccharide to eat it. Now, if I replace this again and put it back where it was, the OH and the H, we're back to this being glucose. This right here is a glucose. Glucose. This guy right here is a fructose. Like if you see high fructose corn sugar. So together, when a glucose and a fructose get together, you have sucrose. And that would be a disaccharide. If you have high fructose corn syrup, um, it's easier for your body to digest, so you'll probably gain more weight taking that than if you have like cane sugar. This would be like from uh, Hawaii or South America, that kind of sugar. Anyway, getting past that, I'm still trying to talk about polymers. Well, long chains of glucose. There's two types. First of all, I just want to leave glucose on the board and nothing else. So here's glucose. I assume you can stop it if you wanted to write something down. Where did I get that from? That was from your text, and it was figures 16.3 and 16, I'm sorry, 16.4 and 16.5. So if you wanted to know where those pictures of these were, 16.4 and 16.5, there's lots of pictures of glucose and sucrose and lactose. That's a disaccharide. And some people can't break lactose down. If you can't break past lactose down, you're lactose intolerant. Doesn't mean you just hate everyone who has the word lactose in their name. It means your body can't break it down. You have a stomach problem with that. This glucose. If this glucose has this OH down, it's an alpha glucose. Okay, if that has that OH down, it's an alpha glucose. But if this OH was up, it would be a beta glucose. And that's going to become important in a moment. So if I were to take this off and put the OH up, it's still glucose. So I know if I change this one, I think the lactose. But if I change this one here, it goes from alpha glucose if the OH is on the bottom to beta glucose if the OH is on the top. So I want to just draw a little of this. So I want to just draw, let's say, an alpha glucose, but not that much of it. So let's say I want to draw an alpha glucose, and I said O and just the ring, this guy going down, and this guy going down. The other ones are still there. There's a CH2OH here, there's an OH here, there's an OH going down here. And that's an H and that's an H. That would be an alpha glucose if it looked like that. A second alpha glucose, here it is. This guy going down, this guy going down. There's still one, two, three, lots of stuff going on here, but I'm not trying to draw the whole thing out and freak you out. If you were to put these two together, they will bond together. If they bond together, if you can see a water, it's going to be a recurring theme today. If you can see a water when they bond, it's a condensation reaction. So this could be a con then station reaction, RxN reaction. Take out the water, and you'd have nothing but this 
carbon, and this would be carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four. It's a carbon one to a carbon four bond of alpha glucoses. If this, let's say, repeated thousands of times, how do you write something repeating thousands of times without actually writing it thousands of times? I could take this off, put the O, and then put a bracket here. And then I can take this off. Let's say I put it to another one of these. Like that. And this O, bracket thousands. I could say a really long chain of thousands of alpha glucoses. Your body can break this. This bond from the carbon one to the carbon four, that's an alpha one four G L Y C O S I D I C glycosidic bond. An alpha one four glycosidic bond you can break in your stomach. This would be starch. So a potato, it's got no fat in it unless you add a lot of fat to a baked potato. It's nothing but that molecule. Your brain only eats glucose, your brain loves it. With that in mind, this was alpha glucose. If I were to change that to a beta glucose, the OH goes up, the H goes down. Now I'm no longer alpha, I'm beta glucose. If you make a long chain of beta glucoses, a beta glucose to a beta glucose, it won't go down like this because this side is down. Carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four. Carbon four is down, but carbon one is up. So let's make a bit of that chain. O, and then I'll go up and this one goes down and then it would go up to the next guy and then this one goes up and then it goes up to the next guy and now this one would just repeat thousands of times so let's just have this repeat thousands of times this would be a carbon one, a carbon four, put an O there, and this would be a carbon one to a carbon four. So a carbon one to a four from a beta glucose, a beta one four G L Y C O S I D I C bond. A beta one four glycosidic bond, your body can't break down. It's not toxic to you. It just is roughage. Your body can't break it down. This is called, I guess, cellulose. So, paper. If I take this sheet of paper right here, this is a bunch of glucoses. In this class, I want you to know what everything is in your life. This is a bunch of glucoses, all bonded in such a way that if I were to swallow it, I would get no nutrition out of it because my body couldn't break it down. It would just be roughage. It would be fiber. Okay? So this one you would call like your wood. So if glucoses are bonded in the alpha 1,4, they become starch and you can eat them. If they become bonded like powder, you could take wood and actually grind it up to make a powder, to make like a flour out of it. And you could make cakes out of it, but you would not be able to like digest it. It's one of the saddest, well, there's many sad things, but the sad thing about the Holocaust, when they wanted to feed and starve people, you would make bread that's partially made out of wood pulp and they couldn't get any nutrition out of it. But it would act the same chemically. It's got the same oxygens. But a termite can eat this. He has a protozoa inside his stomach and he can eat this. So the termites can break it. But you can't. So, altogether, what am I talking about? Natural polymers. What's the natural polymer 
a monomer of starch, a glucose, but it's an alpha glucose. What's the natural polymer monomer of cellulose? It's another glucose, but it's a beta glucose. So they come in nature a bit. It's anything that repaint, re repeats over and over and over and over in nature. Where is this picture? A version of it. They're using a different structure than a ring. They're doing this thing here. There's a more relaxed form of this. It's still got one, two, three, four, five, six, but they do this for these two chains. Traditionally, people do this one and this one, but this is the chair structure because they say it's more of a puckered ring because it is going up and down because it's carbons. This is that 109 degree angle, so it's not really a nice ring. It doesn't actually form a beautiful ring. The angles would be much more tighter. This way, it's more relaxed. So in your text, you can see 16.6, and get a picture of the alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond of starch and the beta 1,4 glycosidic bond for cellulose. And that's your natural polymer. We move on. So before polymers, the world, when they needed something special with special properties, the world had to decide how to make a new thing with special properties. They didn't have plastics. They had wood, they had glass, they had metal. And the metal comes from ores. So what people need to know is all metals mix freely together. If you were to mix let's say copper with a little bit of tin. In nature, copper ore, it's a rock, copper sulfide, but copper ore in nature, you have CUS, there's a little bit of ZN, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of S and S inside of that as well, but it's mostly CUS. This would be like a, a silver color, that would be a yellow color from pennies, the color of coppers. But if you have this in a fire pit, and let's say you have fire, it gets so hot, F-I-R-E, try to write nicely, you smelt, S-M-E-L-T, the metal. always felt that we went from the Stone Age, if you look back in Mesopotamian culture, they wrote on rocks and these beautiful cuneiform tablets and things like that. They wrote the original stories of the Bible in a lot of respects. There's flood stories, but they have many gods involved in it. But a lot of the original stories are on cuneiform tablets. That entire culture, they were using whatever they had. They really didn't have metals at first. Then comes the Bronze Age, my feeling is that if somebody had a fire pit and the walls just happened to be made out of the copper sulfide rock, you would start to see these shiny globules of metal on the bottom, and then you might take the shiny globule of metal and cut something, like cut the skin of an animal and say, oh my God, I made a knife, okay? But either way, if you have copper and tin, they mix easily together as metals, that's an alloy called bronze. We have made coins out of bronze for a long time. We have made silver into coins and we've made gold into coins. Well, naturally in nature, gold and silver were an alloy and we couldn't separate them. And it was called electro. The original coins that people made were made of electrum, because that's just the way it came. And at some point, King Croesus, if you haven't heard the expression, which you haven't, but they haven't heard the expression of rich as Croesus, if you look back at history, the original history books, Herodotus, some Heliconassus, things like that from like, I don't know, 500 or 600 BC, these people were doing a lot of things before then. If you look back in history, 
Um, the original alloys they dealt with were the ones that came natural in nature. You could find some gold and silver together in electrum. And King Croesus was the first one to be able to separate it. Getting past that, then um, your gold was your most expensive coin, your silver was less expensive, and the bronze was less expensive. What do we have left from that now? We have Olympic medals, gold, silver, bronze, if you're wondering. So bronze is copper and tin. Now, if you have copper and zinc, bronze is copper and tin, it has a Z in it. Copper and zinc doesn't have a zinc in a Z in it, it's called brass. I really wish this is the one that had the Z in it, but the word brass means copper and zinc. The word bronze means copper and tin, and they're all alloys. So if you wanted to create something, that we didn't have on this planet, what you would do is you'd say, well, maybe I could mix two metals together. And people used to do that. So people tried to make special space age alloys. For example, lead is very heavy. Aluminum is very light. If you mix 10% aluminum and 80% lead, you have slightly less heavy lead. If you mix 10% lead and 80% aluminum, you might have a slightly stronger piece of aluminum. So that was what we would do. We would mix alloys together and try to get a plane that would be bulletproof but could fly really well in the sky because it was lighter. Then came plastics, and plastics were able to show us we didn't need any of this anymore. Now, out of curiosity, any metal mixed with mercury. Now, mercury is a pure metal that hates being touched, and it's a liquid. In, uh, on the planet, so it's called quicksilver, because if you try to touch it, as kids in the 1970s, we all played with it, we broke a thermometer, you should not play with mercury, but at the time we did play with it, and you try to touch it and rolled away from you, it's kind of fun. So anyway, mercury, it's very dangerous, I'm sure, mercury is more dangerous when it's with an organic molecule, but if you mix anything with mercury, let's say you have mercury and uh, iron, or, or aluminum or something, that's an alloy, but if it's mixed with mercury, it's called an amalgam. They're temperature sensitive. So if you hear about um, some movie where they talk about a special mercury switch, or believe it or not, uh, in your house, there might be uh, something that is in your thermostat that has some mercury in it that is real uh, sensitive to temperature changes. But either way, any two metals is an alloy. We got past alloys, we got plastics. So let's go to plastics now. We first did the natural polymers. So mankind or humankind is going to want to take some of those natural polymers and slightly modify them. So slightly modified natural polymers. I have notes. Well, the first polymer that we used to use would be like, you know, what makes up wood, right? So thin synthetic polymers. First attempt was called celluloid. Celluloid is a lot like cellulose, which is natural. So it's slightly modified cellulose. What is celluloid for? Well, we used to call movie stars celluloid heroes, oddly enough. Because movie film was made of celluloid, and it was very flammable. It caught on fire. 
Now, in a movie theater, you don't want people sneaking into a movie theater. Originally, we didn't have movie theaters with a bunch of doors to get out. They would only go in one direction. We had one way in and one way out because we wanted to make sure people didn't just steal in a movie theater. So you had the movie theater and it had long curtains. Today, the curtains are made of a rock that makes a cloth, believe it or not. It's made up of like asbestos, and I know that sounds horrible, but if it's not in a dust form, you're okay. But it's made up of a rock that doesn't burn. So the movie theaters had rocks that didn't burn, but back then for curtains, they were probably made of something natural. So they would be something like cotton. So the movie theater curtain was very flammable. But then, what's a movie? A movie film had the little holes on it, so it would be pulled through the projector, and it had the pictures, and you would take a bright light, and you would shine it through the movie as the movie rolled by. And when you shine the bright light through the movie as the movie rolled by, it had to be bright enough with a magnifying glass to go all the way to the other side of the room and make a big picture for you. What's interesting about that? They didn't have fluorescent lights. They didn't have uh, LED lights. Any light that was bright enough was an incandescent light. It was extremely hot. If you see an incandescent light, you try to like take it out uh, with your hands, you'll probably burn your hand and you'll be like, I shouldn't have done that. That's a bad thing to do, right? So if you have a really, really, really ridiculously bright light and you aim it through a movie film, it has to be pretty close to the movie film. The movie film was made of celluloid. It's extremely flammable. That's why they always say you don't, well, that's one of the reasons that you shouldn't say a uh, fire in a movie theater. Because in a movie theater, when there'd be a fire back in the projector room, people were worried about the curtains going up. They'd all rush to one door and they'd stampede and hurt themselves. These days, at least people can get the side doors and more people don't even go to movies you watch at home anymore. So anyway, first attempt was celluloid. Celluloid was used for movies, but it's also used for something else. Also used in place, P-L-A-C-E, of ivory. Remember, we didn't have like the ability to have like, we couldn't make this pen, this is plastic, okay? We'd never have a shape like this. So we just had things with wood and metal. So when you found the unique thing in nature, you would use it. Sadly, before people cared a whole lot, elephants, have these long tusks. And if you take an elephant tusk, you can carve it into something, but you have to kill the elephant or the elephant has to have died. And to this day, elephants are always in danger because people want things made of ivory. And we hope they don't want things made of ivory as much as they used to. But oddly enough, like if you go to, um, oh, I don't know, some sort of a place where you would pick up old ivory, um, you shouldn't pick up old ivory. But if you went to an uh, antique store, you might see a little tiny from the 1930s carved elephant that's white. And you'll say, what was this? Oddly enough, they'd murder an elephant to take his tusk to carve up little ivory elephants and sell them to people. People thought differently back then. I hope to God they're not thinking that way anymore. But also, ivory was used for billiard balls. In America, we don't really like billiards. It's not as satisfying. In America, we play pool. But the original pool balls, pools has pockets. In a billiard game, there's no pockets. And it's very frustrating. You're like, why would you even play this? Because you don't get to drop the ball off. It's a whole different kind of a game. OK, but either way, it's still balls rolling around with a cue stick, right? So you've got these billiard balls. They would have to carve them into perfect spheres to be able to roll them perfectly. And you'd have to keep them in like velvet because they would like be affected by the weather. It was really a strange thing. So it's kind of good that we started to use celluloid for billiard balls instead. I just hope the elephants have a chance of living. Anyway, what else we use it for? I don't know. Uh, let's see. Stiff collars. 
for like your shirts or something like that. So that was our first attempt. Then came other attempts. So we have some chemistry that we know, and I'm watching the clock. Don't worry, I know when I started this lecture. So I'm going to show you other types of polymers made from hydrocarbons using functional groups that you know, I hope. And by the way, I figured out how to set this up that the only a little bit of light is coming on top of here so I can use the whole board now. I'm getting better and better at this task. All right, I mentioned condensation. If you have CH3, CH2, C double bond O, OH. This is something that students in your class can name. Functional group. What functional group? You look for the functional group. The functional group, I've given you some homework on this. The functional group has an oxygen in it. If you have R, which means carbon chain, C double bond O, OH, it's called a carboxylic acid. Now, let's say here, you got a benzene ring with an OH. That's an alcohol. If you just have an OH and no Cetobondo next to it, it's called an alcohol. An alcohol and a carboxylic acid can condense. They condense with Condensation. Condensation in your life means water is formed. Okay, condensation means it's raining outside, there's condensation. It's gaseous water becoming liquid water falling from the sky. For me, if I said show the products of these two, you have to write an actual product. Circle the water between the two of them. Take that water out. And by the way, a benzene with an, double, an OH is a phenol. That's an antiseptic. We've talked about that. If you take the water out and put this oxygen directly to that carbon, you condense it, and the water is a byproduct which we don't care about. So now I have CH3, CH2, C double bond O. This is why I taught you organic chemistry. Goes to the O, and then in this case, whatever is ripped after the O is a benzene. New functional group, plus water, plus H2L, or HOH. You can see HOH coming out of it. This is R, C double bond O, O, R. This is an ester. And these smell like fruit or perfumes. They smell like fruit or perfumes. That's an ester. This reaction can go backwards. If it goes backwards, it would go backwards to the alcohol and to the acid. By the way, what acid is that? Acids end in oic acid. Three carbons is pro, propanoic acid plus phenol. I'm not going to name the ester for you. Okay? Um, if you're curious, uh, phenyl propanoate. But either way, it's, um, it's interesting. I wouldn't make you name esters on an exam. It's a way of naming this side and this side together, but I do want you to name acid simple ones. You know, the simplest acid is methanoic acid, then ethanoic acid for two carbons, then propanoic acid, and I want you to name alcohols, and this is one of the alcohols we talked about a lot. Okay, so getting past that. Esters smell good. These usually smell bad. Amines smell like fish, but Acids smell rancid, okay? So let me show you like uh, an acid that really smells bad. CH3, I need to leave one CH2 alone, okay? So bracket CH2 repeated four times, four, five, and then, no, 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 I'm leaving three times. 
three times four CH2 five C double bond O O H. If I asked you to name this on an exam, you would say, okay, there's an acid, I'm hoping, because it's a C double bond O H at the end of a chain. It's not a C double bond O O C, right? And it's got how many carbons? One, two, three, four, five, six carbons to hexanoic acid. This is the smell of goats. I think you think of Capricorn as caproic acid in the old days. But either way, it's the smell of goats. It smells bad. If you were to take methanol, now I would draw it this way for you. Put these CH3OH, because I'd like you to be able to show me the product. Okay, so it's a methanol. Normally I'd write methanol on exam as CH3OH with the OH coming off, but I want the OH to touch the carboxylic acid because I want you to be able to circle and glue things together. So in this case, this is your alcohol, and here's your acid. You circle the water, and you don't just finish and say, I'm done, I circled the water. You have to draw the products on the exam. Write everything you see up to here, take the water out, glue that part on it. So you got CH3, bracket CH2, repeated three times, CH2, C double bond O, and then OCH3. This is your ester, and it could be a perfume. All these smell good. So let's talk about perfumes. I want to speak about perfumes. Trace the guy on top. First of all, I often ask questions during my class. I ask a lot of questions. I tell a lot of stories and I, I hang out with the students for a long time, but I really can't ask you questions through this medium right now. So let me just say, some of you have tried a perfume not something you eat, okay? You go to a perfume counter, less and less, I'm sure, each day. I'm sure everything's online now. You don't do things socially. But if you still went to a perfume counter, they would say, okay, here's a perfume. Would you like to try it? They'd say, yeah, I want to try it. So they could spray it on a card, or they say to you, you know, let's spray it on your hand because, well, students would normally answer questions now. Why do they spray it on your hand? And they say, well, perfumes react differently with different people. If you take this perfume and spray it on your dry hand, it's going to smell just like it does on a car. It's not going to smell any different. For this to actually break up, this could break up with sweat. So if you were to sweat, but it has to be over a period of time. So I tell students, if you want to try a perfume out, you're dying to try this one new perfume out, and you want to go to the perfume counter and try it, you basically exercise a whole lot until you're sweating horribly. And then you go and you spray the stuff in yourself, and then you wait a couple hours so that if it's gonna break up on you and go back to the smell of goats, it'll have a chance to do that. And then you have someone who hasn't smelled you all day smell you. If that person smells you and they say, look, that's not the perfume for you, that's not the cologne for you, what are you thinking? Well, now you know you can't have that perfume. So I want people in this class to know exactly what it means to try a perfume. It doesn't just mean spray it on your hand and you say it smells good. After a day of sweating, it might smell horrible. There are antiperspirants and deodorants, and a deodorant is going to not block sweat, okay? So it might be better for you, but worse in other ways. But it's actually better for you, I'm sure. But getting past that, if you sweat a whole lot, perfumes are hit and miss because you'll shut down your own senses to how bad you smell. Okay, so be careful with that. All right, the condensation reaction. Now, imagine if I had a bottle and one bottle was CH, oh, better yet, let me write it out this way OH. CH2, CH2, OH, and it's a liquid. 
There's my bottle, minding its own business. It's got uh, a dye all. It's a uh, it's uh, ethyl dye all. Okay, but you don't have to name that thing to me. It's a glycol. We'll call it the old days. But anyway, now we have another bottle. And this other bottle, once again, minding its own business, not asking to be part of this game. This is a benzene ring, but it's got a C double bond O O H. If it's a benzene, that would be benzoic acid. If it's an aldehyde, it's benzaldehyde. Like this would be benzaldehyde. If I have just an alcohol, ah, if I have just an alcohol on it, we work. That was phenol, not benzol. This was benzaldehyde, that was benzoic acid. So let's say this bottle has a special benzoic acid-like molecule inside of it. Here's the benzoic acid-like molecule. It's got two of these, so it's a double benzoic acid. Once again, it's a liquid mind in its own business. You can see this can bond to this, and it can condense. If you would have poured these two bottles, now a bottle is going to have not one molecule in it only. It's going to have trillions. If you learn general chemistry, it's got 6.02 by 10 to the 23rd for every mole. You have to figure out what a mole is. Not part of this class, oddly enough, okay, because I'm not doing the math. But if it's a bottle, it's got trillions of these, and this bottle's got trillions of these. If I were to put this inside of a beaker with something that started this reaction, it'd have to have an initiator, but it would probably go anyway. Let's say this was 50 milliliters. Let's say this was 50 milliliters. I now have 100 milliliters, but it might be a solid. Why in the world would this become a solid is the next question. Well, there's something special about these molecules. They're not just an alcohol on one side or not just an acid on one side. This guy here can condense when he sees a carboxylic acid, but the other side of this carboxylic acid, another one of them can come along. And there could be another condensation. And this guy here, there's a carboxylic acid on this side, and this guy can join with an alcohol, CH2, CH2OH. Remember, there's trillions in the bottle. And this would happen until you get in a long, long, long chain. So big, it becomes a solid. This would be called a polymer. But the polymer would be a bunch of what? Take out the water, a bunch of esters. So a condensation polymer from a dye alcohol and dye acid is called a polyester. There is only so much cotton in this world for you to wear, okay? There's only so much cotton, there's only so much wool, there's only so many sheep. Cotton needs to be ironed. It's something that, like this shirt, every day in my life I iron my shirt. I put a lot of starch on it, which, believe it or not, is the, the raw material that makes up my shirt anyway, because it's glucose, so I'm kind of reinforcing my shirt because my shirt's made of cotton. But most of you are wearing polyesters. You're wearing Saudi Arabian oil. With that in mind, that's one type of condensation polymer. There's another condensation polymer. If you remember, let's do this one. Let's say that's a benzene with an amine group, NH2. An old name for that, I'm not going to make you know, analyze. But it's a benzene with an amine group. And let's say on the other side, it was a diamine. Then a person puts next to it the classic carboxylic acid. 
let's make a very unhappy carboxylic acid. I hope you can see water in that. If I gave you this molecule and this molecule, I'd want you to circle water, glue this nitrogen to this carbon, and rewrite everything else to see. N, H, H, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I went to an N, H, but now I go to the C double bond, O, C, H, two, C double bond, O, O, H. An alcohol and an acid made an ester. An amine and an acid does condensation. This is plus H2O many times. This is plus H2O many times. You can see the water flying out of it. But instead of an ester, this thing is called an amide. So in your life, if you've ever bought a serious glue, not just Elmer's glue, or not even like super glue. You bought a glue that came in two bottles, and you mix the two bottles together, and you got a certain amount of time before it's glue, glue, glue. Oh my God, it's never gonna come apart. It might be one bottle with an amine and one side with an acid, and then you mix it together, you're making an acrylamide, acrylic nails, things like that. The word acryl in there, because because it smells and it makes you cry. It's a lacrimator, these things, believe it or not. They make you cry, but not lactating, okay? But a lacrimator. But getting past that, an acrylamide, I'd like you in my class to know that if someone were to give you an amine and an acid, you should condense them and make the amide. And if someone gave you an alcohol and an acid, you should condense them and make the ester. I'd like you to know the story of uh, how polyesters are made, but I'd also like you to know the perfume talk too that you could have a perfume and how it could backwards and unzip itself to the carboxylic acid. Ah, I just want to put certain things in your head. So these are all of your condensation polymers that I care about right now. Now I want to do a different type of polymer, but I'm going to keep my eye on this clock. I think I started, uh, oh, so this is 50 minutes. All right, so this will be the first break in the class. I keep bringing other professors into this room to show them how nice it is to film in here, you know? Past your 180, it's a great place to film. So let me, for now, stop this recording and start in a minute.